remember there was one, um, I think it was the weekend, I think it was like a Sunday afternoon, that was about a month or so before we were going to start shooting and the set was standing there in the studio ready to go. And I got a few of the of the people on the film, Rick Porus, um, our, our, our co-producer came along and... Uh, and uh, one of the special effects guys, and I was there, and we had our screenplay. Peter could talk me and the rest of us into anything. Initially, he worked through, he said, okay, well, what we'll do is, uh, you know, I'll direct this stuff. We had Brian Van Tull um, do the camera work. Uh, Charlie McClellan, who was uh, one of the visual effects producers at the time, he started off as, as Gandalf. And Randy Cook, our animation director, he, he played Sam. Peter was playing, well, he wasn't playing Bilbo to start off with. I think he had Rick Porras playing Bilbo. I, I definitely can't act to save my life. And, uh, you know, but I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll just, I'll read for Pete just so that he can work through the angles. And um, we got to this point in the first scene and Pete goes, cut, great. Okay, so listen, what we're gonna do next is I'll play Bilbo. <laughs> of course, of course. Just waiting for the right moment. Don't leave it too late. He's very fond of you. I know, I know. <laughs> Bilbo? I am old Gandalf. I don't look it, but I, I'm beginning to feel it in my heart. <laughs> and I think that's one of the best moments of uh, cinematic history right there. <laughs> Scene 12, shot 24, take 4. Isn't that odd? Yet after all, uh, why not? Well, why shouldn't I keep it? I think you should leave it behind, Bilbo. Is that so hard? W well, no. It, it, yes, and when it comes down to what I, I don't feel like having with it. Why, why should I? What business is it with yours anyway? It's mine. I found it. It came to me. There's no need to get angry. <laughs> well, if I'm angry, it's your fault. You know, it's mine. It's my own. It's my precious. It has been called that before, but not by you. God, oh, that miserable wretch. So wicked. He would have killed me. Yeah, I he called me sneak, thief, liar. But it's mine. Bilbo Baggins, do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks. <laughs> I'm not trying to rob you, but to help you. All your long years we have been friends. Trust me as you once did. Let it go. I will. Yes. The ring can stay here with Frodo with all the rest. Yes, well, I, I, I must be going. I, I really must be going. It's, it's, I, I'm late. And the road is, is long. Bilbo? Yes? The ring is still in your pocket. Oh, good, good gracious. So it is. <laughs> Recording. Okay, this is scene 12, shot three, second half of the shot. 
Well, this is really quite simple. Do you take a Gandalf? Here, it's yours. Through me, that ring would wield a power too great and terrible. I would become like the Dark Lord himself. Well, all right. We'll put it back in the trunk. It's not as if the Dark Lord is going to come, come knocking on the door of Bag End. Is he? Is he Gandalf? I, I tried to find the creature Gollum. I looked everywhere for him, but the enemy found him first. Shire? Baggins? That's gonna lead them straight here. Straight to me. Bang! Samwise Genji, you've been eavesdropping. I ain't been dropping no week, sir, honest. I was just trimming the hedge under the, the board of the window, if you know what I'm following. It's a little late to be gardening, Samwise Genji. I heard Mr. Frodo cry out. I was worried. Please, Mr. Gandalf, don't hurt me. Don't turn me into anything unnatural. I think one of the remarkable things about reading The Lord of the Rings is you go into this world which is, you know, fairy tale. It's, it's dragons and it's trolls and it's hobbits and it's elves. And it's amazing how authentic, genuinely authentic it feels. That you start to believe that it could possibly be history. That somehow Tolkien found some lost parchment and, he, you know, some secret parchment that we don't know about that he really took all this from a, a true historical events, it has that degree of believability about it. I, I guess the way that we tried to hint at the depth, which is all that the film can really do, um, was partly in our design process. While we were working on the screenplay, we were able to start a, a team of people designing. Because the great thing about Tolkien is that um, all the descriptions and of what you need to build are in the book. You don't actually have to wait for the, for the script to finish, unlike you would on a normal movie. I didn't want movie design. I, di I didn't want fantasy, movie, Hollywood sort of style of design. I wanted something that felt authentic. I gave a little speech to the, uh, to the design crew very early on where, I'm, this is a little bit weird, but it was the only way I could really express myself. I said, look, we've been given the job of making The Lord of the Rings, but I want to, from this point on, I want to think that The Lord of the Rings is real, that it was actually history, that these events happened. And more than that, I want us to, to imagine that we've been lucky enough to be able to go on location and shoot our movie where the real events happened. Those characters did exist and they wore costumes, and I want the costumes to be totally accurate to what the real people wore. Hobbiton still exists, it's overgrown with weeds and it's been run down and neglected for the last three or four hundred years, but we're gonna go back in there and clean it up. We're the luckiest film crew in the world. We were able to shoot in the real locations that these real events actually took place in. And that was, that was effectively my speech to try to get everybody's head into what I actually sort of, sort of wanted in terms of a feeling of reality. You basically start thinking about what the places and the characters look like and you realise that there's 40 years of artwork that people have done. And out of all the illustrations, all the artwork that's been done in calendars and books and you know album covers and all sorts of things, the work of Alan Lee and John Howe impressed us the most. We had their artwork literally pinned on the wall of our office for 12 to 14 months while we were working on the screenplay. But I also thought it would be wonderful if we actually had these guys involved in the film as, con as conceptual artists, because we had, by this stage, totally locked into their artwork. And I remember it was incredibly difficult to, um, to find Al Alan Lee, who's a fairly reclusive chap, and nobody really had a phone number for him. So we eventually um, tracked him down to a small village near Dartmoor in England. We put together um, a package and we FedExed us to this address, and we were tracking the FedEx but we were literally tracking the van moment by moment. Um, Jan, our, our assistant, was on the phone and she was saying, right, the van's about 50 miles from the village. And then she phoned back, yes, it's arrived in the village, it's just looking for a street. 
And then we got a call back from FedEx saying, yes, so it's been delivered, it's been delivered. And, 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 and we knew at that exact moment that Alan had signed for this thing at his front door and he'd got it. He sent over a copy of Heavenly Creatures, which I'd heard of, which I hadn't, hadn't seen and uh, enjoyed very much, with uh, a letter telling me what he, what he was up to and um, asking if I'd like to get involved. We thought, oh, well, he'll probably get, get in touch in, in a day or two. OK, well, at least it's there. We'll just wait and see. And about, um, about three and a half hours later, Alan phoned up. He, he, used, he got our phone number, he phoned up. And three and, a half, three and a half hours, he'd sat down, he'd watched Heavenly Creatures all the way through, he'd watched Forgotten Silver all the way through, and then he, he, picked, he picked up the phone and um, spoke to me. I didn't really need to think about it, actually. I just sort of said, yes, I'll, I'll come out. And John Howe was similar. We tracked down John Howe, who lives in Switzerland. I spoke to John on the phone, and I was just nervous on these phone calls. I was just like a kid. It was about two or three in the morning, because somebody in New Zealand had, hadn't really thought about what time it was in um, where we lived in Switzerland. And there was Peter and Fran on the phone, you know, making a very, very sincere sales pitch for the project. And it was really a question of waiting for them to finish so I could say yes. And then in, in the space of probably within two or three weeks, um, Alan and John were um, flying to New Zealand and they actually met each other for the first time. These are two renowned talking artists that had never met each other before. They, they met each other on the plane flying to New Zealand. It started off very much on an illustrator's level where it was nothing but pencils and paper, meetings, ideas, sketches. And we, we joined in with Weta's team of designers as well, who'd already been working on the project. A vital person um, in the design process was Richard Taylor, who's a New Zealander, and Richard's worked on, on almost every film that I've made, it was certainly since Meet the Feebles. And Richard has the most wonderful team of designers who work with him at Weta, and, you know, as Alan Lee and John Howe were working on their conceptual design, so too were Richard and his team. Initially, we had Alan Lee and John Howe working in our facility as well. Because they were here, we were able to utilise their immense uh, knowledge of the world of Middle Earth and lift our young New Zealand designers to a level that was uh, capable of accomplishing the massive task ahead. I wanted Grant Major to design the film, and Grant had uh, worked with me on it. Heavenly Creatures and the Frighteners. New Zealand has never done a project on this sort of scale before. I'd never done a project on this scale before. So we were sort of breaking new territory a lot with the way we planned these things and keeping a large amount of people motivated and able to meet deadlines and keep up a standard of work through a very, very long period of time. I wanted Dan Henner to be our art director. Um, who've done The Frighteners. You know, very important that those guys are part of the New Zealand film industry. They know how to get that stuff made and, and uh, built here in New Zealand. The design process was, was a lot of fun. We, I would simply go and walk around and talk to them and give them thoughts and you just narrow things down. Peter will come in and we'll put a whole bunch of drawings up on the wall, a couple hundred drawings that we've been doing over the past few days. We'd each have two or three different takes on any particular environment. I sort of tend to like, I mean, I, I relate quite well to that so, as a silhouette of shape. I mean, do, do you, I think it has yeah. a sort of elegance to it. We start doing drawings, and we get a little way with the drawings, and then, you know, after the feed, based on the feedback that Pete gives us, we start going into sculptures. It was like being in a toy shop, really, and just being able to say, oh, well, I want one of those, and one of those, and let's have three of those. And, you know, and, and being able to sort of work all these designs out. Occasionally you would do a single drawing and people would go, that's it, love it, that's great, follow that line. Other times we would put up, um, in the case of the Urukai, a couple of hundred drawings before we got anywhere near what Pete was actually wanting. You know, Peter's got a very good eye. You know, he knows what he's asked for. And when you, you know, you've got to give him solid designs. He would always find some positive aspect to everything that was done, but he would also be able to make you feel you weren't quite there yet. And you'd go away thinking to yourself, I've got to get this right. And it was really stimulating, really, really stimulating. And many, many times he pushed, um, he pushed Alan and I much, much farther than we would have normally gone on our own in a, in a design process. We tried to give all the different cultures a very distinctive design. We wanted the, you know, the dwarfish culture to be very, very distinctly different from, you know, the Gondorian or the, the Elvish. Everything about the way that character's dressed, the way they move, 
uh, the colours that they wear, the shapes that are on their clothing, on their weaponry, on their armour. We wanted to make it look like you could look at a piece of architecture and tell if it was dwarven or elven immediately just by looking at it. If you looked at a weapon and then you looked at the architecture, you could tell which cultures were the same and which were different. So that meant establishing iconic designs. It's, it's, it's graphic design really at its basic level. Dwarves at a basic level, their shapes are square, they're rigid, they're you know sturdy, um, very much like the character of the dwarves, the elven stuff. Very lyrical, very beautiful, very sinuous, uh, very elegant. So that kind of thought went into it, uh, and into establishing very clear and identifiable graphic styles of all the different races that would carry through all their design influences. We were also trying to hint at this whole notion of art history. Much of Middle-earth was actually constructed by the Numenorians. So the bones of the architecture of Middle-earth were built by a people who were no longer there. But some hint of this has to come through. You know, the idea of layers of civilization going back over thousands of years, which it, it's a very hard thing to, to do in a, in, in a film or to achieve on, on a film set. But just by, you know, laying much more design into the uh, development of every part of the film, whether it's props or costumes, armor or buildings, than we'd ever actually really see on film. But its presence would be felt in, in some sort of strange way. When I first came onto the film, I began the same day as Alan Lee and John Howe. I spent the time myself designing um, from an architectural point of view from the illustrations that John Allen had done. Some of these were initially made into architectural models. We have to get rid, be very careful, we have to get rid of some of these little thin tenderly ones. As Peter agreed with various stages of the design, we called it a lock-off, a PJ lock-off. We he would see, would say, yes, okay, proceed. And we would proceed to the next step. We had a little star-shaped stamp made, which, which had PJ approved on because these approvals were very, very critical to us. We, we really weren't able to move on until he had seen and agreed to what we were doing. At about that time, we were having a series of meetings. We were pigeonholing things about what would become sets, what would become part set, part model, and then what would become part set, part model, and part computer graphic extensions. A lot of it was strategic design for how we were gonna get to the point where we could start rolling the cameras um, you know, and start filming sets. It's a pretty magical vista around here. There's no, there's no doubt. It's nice I mean, having its own little valley, you know, right? Yeah. I think, I think we should, um, we should go and relocate into a couple of. Other I remember our first trip to the Hobbiton location or the potential location at that point, and there was this great moment occurred when um, Alan Lee and John Howe pulled out their sketch pads. They always went everywhere with it, with it, with it, with pencils and paper. You could sit in that landscape and see Hobbiton, almost as if you could do an overlay in front of your, in front of your eyes. And uh, Alan and I sat down uh, on the hill above Bag End and started to draw because there was the perfect landscape for Hobbiton. We were actually drawing the landscape but putting the Hobbit holes and the gardens and the fields and everything. So they were transforming it, the, the landscape on paper and I, I just thought this is a great moment and I remember we had a video camera there so I actually grabbed the video camera because I thought this, this has got to be on, be on the DVD. And, and, I, and I grabbed the video camera and I actually filmed myself, I filmed some stuff of, of, them, of them, you know, in this moment where they were sketching. Yep, let me just get a close up in here and then I'll let you get the still. And the final look of the, um, of the finished set, I don't know, a year later or whatever, um, was quite close to those original sketches. The style of Hobbiton was first and foremost to be homely and um, familiar. So it has a kind of an Englishness to it that I think Tolkien would have liked us to use. We talked to Peter and he said, why don't you know Hobbiton? We want Hobbiton to look beautiful. It's got to have long grass. It's got to look as though the grass has been there forever. It's got to have fruit trees with fruit on them, it's got to have hedges with leaves on them, it's, it's a big, it's a big place. How much lead in time do you think you need to make it look as though it's always been there? We said, well, you know, a year would be good. Okay, yeah, I think, I think we could do a year, you know, and so, so we started planning from a very early age with Hobbiton, 
that we would begin construction a year out from filming. OK, so today, today we're going to Hobbiton and sort of briefly, actually, Peter, this is the first time Peter is having a look at our work. Since we found the location, we've conceptualised it um, with Peter's involvement back in Wellington. Uh, we've had builders up here, landscapers and the army in here to build roads and a huge amount of effort and time and money being spent on it without Peter actually having been here to vet it. We've been reporting back to him with uh, as much as we can with photographs and videos and kind of verbal questions and what have you. Uh, but this is the first day Peter's actually going to see it and uh, it's going to be great because he's either going to like it or he's not. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. I mean, we just need to get a lot of bushes and sort of make it more wild and woolly and sort of overgrown. But are they a few little bushes that are going down there? Garden, sort of, they're doing gardens. Right. Um, but I've told them just to keep putting bushes in until now, until Christmas. You know. Yeah. It's all around the chimneys, all around this, this stone wall. Yeah. Um, you know, along the fence lines and things ought to the, be scrubbed. The fence lines, there should be stuff all around the fence lines, yeah, you don't want those to be too clean. And as part of the sort of general process of building it, we built a model of it in our art department computer. Parallel to this, we built a huge architectural model. It would have been, you know, four or five metres square. This would have been about a, a year and a half out from filming. Once we'd found the location and worked out what we required there, there was we had to shift uh, 5,000 cubic metres of earth, we had to drain a swamp, uh, fill it in, make the party field, uh, we had to build a big oak tree above Bag End, and then of course we had to build some sort of little hillocks to have hobbit holes. And we cut into our little hillocks the fronts of where the hobbit holes were going to be. We sowed grass over the hills. We planted little market gardens and we planted trees. Oh, that little hobbit hole. I feel like knocking on the door and popping in for a cup of tea. Second breakfast, perhaps. Once all these things have been planted, it was really a matter of keeping it all going, letting nature take its course over the year. It was a very long and organic process, um, designing and building it, but, uh, um, you know, I'd like to think that the Hobbiton needed that scale of detail to work well. John and I, obviously, we each had quite a, a backlog of work that we'd done with these stories, so there were certain images that Peter had really liked. A good example is the front hall of Bag End, because Peter had in mind an image that I'd done for a map of The Hobbit several years before. It was just the most brilliant image of what the inside of the Bag End front hall might be like. And I basically just said, look, you know, this is what I want in a movie. I've been looking at this picture for like two years now, wondering what the rest of Bag End is like. So can you please draw me the rest of Bag End? And he did it, was, and that was a great thrill of saying, you know, taking this hallway and then having the actual artist, John, that, like extend it into all the, all the other rooms. artist and he's doing the view from Strider's uh, room at the Prancing Pony and that's the view from the room. Brie was a lot simpler to design than many of the other ones because it was relying a lot more on vernacular English period architecture. We built most of Brie as a set piece, so it only exists in one instance as a computer-generated um, wide shot. So uh, yeah, we built it in what used to be an old Navy base in, here in Wellington, in Port Dorset, and uh, used one or two existing streets on which to build the set. We worked on making everything quite tall, quite thin, slightly off plumb as it were, so the buildings all felt as though they were leaning in over you. And then the Prancing Pony itself, that whole scale issue once again came into play where 
all the tables and chairs were big, all the um, the people were huge, you know, and the our little guys were uh, sort of slightly vulnerable. And, and so everything, there was a darkness, a slightly gothic edge to, um, to Brie. The Weathertop Hill was actually quite difficult to find that location. It's described as being a hill like a cone, and the one that we found for the movie actually doesn't quite fit that description, but it's more interesting, and we just thought that this was um, a wonderful, wonderful Weathertop. We just had to put ruins on the top of the hill. It's the possible western Weathertop Hollow, and uh, there's the uh, escape vehicle cast on the, on the muddy road. Oh, it's going to be a long walk. So the ruins and the wide shots are just put in with a computer, but when the hobbits are actually within that circle of ruins, they are in a studio set. Basically, it's a ruined tower that once held um, the, one of the Palantirs. We've built, really, from the Tolkien's basic description of the, the ruins of a circular tower. We've added these uh, statues, which are, they're not complete yet. They're going to be more broken down. I've never done this before. And uh, the figures were sculpted by um, Brigitte, who's one of our very talented sculptors. But as a sculptor, she's probably not the person to be actually attacking them and aging them down. I guess they just sort of represent uh, some element of the kind of the age of, of this this place, but they're also kind of like a brooding presence, a kind of foreboding what's about to happen, spectators really, of the, um, of the events that can unfold in this uh, arena. Isengard comes directly from an illustration of Alan's which Peter loved so much he wanted exactly the same, but Alan had only drawn the bottom portion. I always looked at that painting wondering what the rest of the tower was like. You know, I just wondered what, what, how, how high is it and what's the top of it like? And so it was just such a brilliant painting. And so I, the day finally arrived, I could say to Alan, can you, can you paint me the rest of the tower? Can, please, can you show me what the rest of it is like? It is described as being black by Tolkien. So we chose obsidian volcanic glass as the element that it had been made from. So we wanted to give it a, a sharp, blade-like, hard, aggressive quality. We built the structure out of um, a normal framework of polystyrene and then we coated it with um, a hard coat, a black hard coat and then a clear hard coat. So we built up the sort of layers of lacquer virtually to give it a depth so at the, the pointy edges you could see through it. And then we waxed it, which gave it even more sort of texture to the depth. There was a, a lot of different elements in, in that design. You know, everything feels like it belongs in that one place. And um, that was a, you know, another really satisfactory set to work on. It wasn't a place I particularly wanted to spend a night, but it would be um, a nice place for a very sophisticated cocktail party. Or... Yeah, at, at the moment, I'm just trying to, um, to draw this as a landscape just exactly as I would if I were, uh, you know, sitting in a wood drawing something for uh, pleasure and then kind of adding in the, um, the various architectural elements that I'm kind of making up as I, as I go along, really. I'm just trying to get a feeling of the place as it is and that its potential as a sort of as a place for the, for the elves. How do you define a culture which, is, which could be eternal, that could be ever, forever perfecting itself? You have to search for some form of simplicity which can allow you to stop evolving and find that perfect line. It's the use of natural forms. It's the use of flowing, graceful lines. There are kind of elements of Art Nouveau and chaotic design, but it is quite an intuitive, enigmatic thing. It's not something that's easy to kind of pin down. With Rivendell, I think I was trying to create a place that I'd um, want to retire in. It's just this ideal environment in a, in a beautiful lost valley. And the whole thing would feel slightly 
kind of melancholic and and quiet and also this you get the sense that it was a, a center of, of learning that there'd be libraries and statues works of art the Rivendell exterior sets were built in a small regional park called Kaitoki just north of Wellington it's a sort of peculiar set in that it's it's inside outside the trees grow inside the buildings the buildings are built around the trees it's very much as as Lothlorien was at, at one with nature at one with its sort of foliage and uh, we made a model of the woods and placed every tree and then just made um, a small scale version of the buildings and just worked out a way that we could place the buildings in a way that wouldn't damage any trees and that the buildings would have kind of openings which allowed for the trees to grow so that you'd feel that the trees had grown up around these buildings which had been there for a thousand years or so. Yeah, it was just one of those places that I, I personally wanted to spend a lot of time. I even thought about sleeping overnight in Frodo's bed, but I don't think the props people would have been quite happy about that. The next major thing was um, the interiors of Elrond's chamber and the council chamber, which was built in the studio. And um, again, that was a very lovely, very lovely set. The dressing of Elrond's house reflects Elrond having this um, world-renowned library in his house. It also forms in part a museum of all these significant events, and in particular the fall of Baradur for the first time and the, um, the, the loss of the ring. So this is manifested in a lot of um, sort of prop detailing, but um, most of all in Narsal, the broken, the broken sword is, is present and as a centrepiece in, the, in this museum, and also along the walls are a series of, of paintings or frescoes, um, one or two of them done by Alan Lee. They basically were the history of the elves, and they're the most beautiful, stunning pieces of artwork. The boats that they arrived in, near the making of elven rings. The centrepiece is Sauron smashing uh, Narsal, and then there's various other pieces of elven history on either side. The Mines of Moria was probably the most studio-based out of everything we had done to date. Uh, we used miles and miles and miles of rockwork. There's various layers of occupation, you could say and there's this natural layer of rock. There's this dwarven layer. There's this orcish layer that we, that we see more and more of as we go through. There's this dis destruction layer where battles have happened, battles have been lost. You know, the closer we get to where the Balrog lives, the more smashed up it is. The dwarvish architecture we decided was going to be entirely geometric, that there wouldn't be any curves or um, any rounded forms, any round arches, so that it would all feel very uh, kind of crystalline. And that design ethic was kind of followed through into um, the armour and the weapons and, and every aspect of the of the dwarves, really. I think they're, they're big people at heart. <laughs> they, uh, they were, you know, had a grand civilization and they, um, you know, just felt right that they would, that they would built enormously impressive structures. Much of it's manifested through model work. You know, as soon as we go mega wide, obviously that's way bigger than what we could afford to build and our studios could accommodate. So, um, you know, the CG and model work um, plays a large part in the, in the immensity of the Mines of Moria. I had drawn the Dwardov chamber before with arches and rounded Columns, but um, thinking a little, in a little bit more detail about ways of distinguishing the, the dwarves from everyone else, I changed my mind about dwarven architecture after <laughs> after working on this film. And um, so the Dwarf Elf Chamber, which was entirely digitally created, except for a few kind of just the very bottom ends of the pillars, which were um, kind of set pieces. That was all based on. Uh, 
one drawing that I did which uh, incorporated the, the pillar designs and the, the sense of scale that uh, you want to establish in a, in a place like that. In the screenplay that we wrote, it describes the Fellowship fleeing from the first appearance of the Balrog. The script says something like, they run down a, some stairs and across the bridge of Khazadum. And um, Alan Lee went away and uh, drew the stairs. And what he brought back to me was kind of pretty mind-blowing. Uh, it was more than just what I was imagining a staircase to look like. It was this incredible cavern, an image of, of this cavern with this narrow staircase on the top of this huge, huge viaduct-like kind of pillars. In the course of drawing that, I thought, well, I'll just make a little break or two in that staircase. And, um, and then Peter really latched onto that. <laughs> I, I, just, I just looked at this, this hole in the stairs and I started to sort of imagine other things happening <laughs> around that hole. <laughs> And that really was the seed of what ultimately became, you know, one of the most extended sort of action set pieces in the entire movie. And the script still says, and says to this day, the Fellowship run downstairs towards the bridge. That's all that it says. Good morning, Paul. Hello. <laughs> what are you working on? Terrace Galadon, the Lothlorian Woods. Where do the elves live? There's gonna be a little Frodo and crew somewhere in here. The camera will kind of pull back from them to reveal the city. Palace, rather. Tolkien's descriptions of Lothlorien are amongst the most um, beautiful and enigmatic writings in, in his work. So it was really quite a big challenge trying to come up with something that would match those. I wanted Lothlorien to be, you know, obviously elvish, but to have a distinctly different feel. And the fact that it's built up in treetops is obviously going to be a huge part of that difference. We also wanted it to feel slightly more unworldly, otherworldly and more mysterious and a, probably a more kind of spiritual place as though Lothlorien is the, the, the spiritual heart of the elven kingdoms on, on Middle-earth. We needed to, to find a forest that had that beautiful magical essence to it but also had these huge trees which of course we don't have huge trees quite like these in New Zealand so we had to build some trees and we did it up at Paradise with a beautiful moss covered ground in the beech forest and then we built five huge like 16 foot diameter trees that went up 40 feet odd into the air. Once once they've made contact with the elves you move on into Karaskaladon which is this is where the melon trees are. So we built these essentially built the melon trees in the studio. Um, and gave them great big root, root structures that the guys could have a little settlement under, their, their sort of pavilion. I think there was that essence that the elves were at one with nature, with the forest, you know, they were part of it, as, as opposed to being dominating it. They were working with it. You know, whereas we would have gone in with a chainsaw and cleared a place and built a house, They've done the opposite. They've gone in and worked with the trees and added staircases and put in flats that they could live on in perfect crotches of trees, things like that. Uh, Galadriel's Glade was quite a, quite a nice little set. This was the first, our first look at the, the actual Lothlorien trees and um, was trying to kind of establish the look of the, of the roots and everything. And uh, you know, follow that through with the design of the of the plants and the um, the bowl and the and the vase. And it was it was very nice actually seeing that scene coming together. Yes. Galadriel has always been a yeah, hugely important character for me in the books. So to see you know Kate Blanchett standing in Galadriel's glade, it's very very nice, very exciting. We're at the Silverlode Riverbank 
uh, in Featherston, which is where Gladriel gives all our hobbits and the fellowship uh, we present as they as they leave Lothlorien. We built a, a bit of a, a melon tree here, six metres high and about or six metres in diameter, with roots that run out into the lake so that we can pull up our boats into the roots. To build it, we did a timber frame, put chicken mesh and foil over that with uh, hessian on it, then plastered the whole thing, then given it all a coat of paint in the rain. We've eventually ended up with a really um, interesting texture there that could look a thousand years old. From the moment we see the Argonaths, we are sort of on the outer reaches of what used to be the empire of the Numenorians, as they were in the Second Age. Now the Argonaths were like two sentinels on the outside of one of the approaches to this huge, huge empire. We wanted to give the feeling that we were, you know, just we were entering the realm of this very, very ancient civilization, long past its prime. It's like kind of ancient Rome or Egypt or Mesopotamia. It's almost as if you're digging things out of the ground rather than actually creating them. The ruins themselves are based on the architecture of men, some of which we had seen before, um, for example, on Weathertop. So we kept back a lot of our ruined pieces, knowing that we were going to need them later on in the filming. And uh, we made a few new ones, like this gigantic face that was lying on, the, um, on its side. The seeing seat itself at the top has got these eagle motifs, suggesting that because eagles have this acute vision, that, that that's kind of connected with um, what uh, Frodo is going to see. New Zealand doesn't have a lot of ancient stones and stuff around the landscape. Everything had to be introduced, and it's mainly made of polystyrene. But um, I think it, you know, did the trick really. It just made you feel that you were in a in a very, very ancient land. Are we, are we going to have like sort of big pumpkins and sort of stuff? And, you know, we have a little guy kind of who's just scored a, you know, a good cheap bloody buy. Propping for the film was an industry in itself. The film demanded a particular type of prop that you just don't get in the prop shops or antique shops. So we had to build up our own props department and build everything from scratch. We also had to do it because of scale. We were constantly needing to duplicate different props at different scales. A huge amount of stuff had to be made and it meant designing everything, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Absolutely, absolutely crazy. But I think this is one of the strengths of The Lord of the Rings is because everything had to be designed. There, was, there were no shortcuts. There was no sort of going out and picking something off a shelf. Had to put a bit of thought into it. We've lengthened that, put a bit more of a curve in it and straightened the bowl so you've, you've got it down in this sort of position. The bowl is actually straight. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Every this pipe, every... every chair, every cup, saucer, glass. Everything was designed specifically for the film, so we had to make it. We did have to look at, look for people with these sorts of school bases within the community, people who can make the one ring. Um, those sorts of things were contracted out to craftspeople, silversmiths, art makers, saddlery makers. We got a glass blower and we got some furniture makers and some wood carvers, a chap who could make um, clay pipes, coopers to make barrels and buckets, uh, wheelwrights to make wheels for wagons. It starts off at the conceptual area but it works right through down to the ground level. Guy who's applying the, the ageing to a wooden bucket to make it look as though it's carried water for 300 years, you know. Yeah, just doing these little buttons that um in two scales for this chest here, it's little babies, and getting them exactly the same. And finding these sorts of people who are willing to work um, day and night for a year, two years, to make uh, the amount of props we needed it was huge.
As a props department, art department, we took responsibility for the ring. Had it made by an absolutely wonderful master, silversmith, goldsmith, Jens Hansen. Something like 15 rings made of, of that sort of vaguely fell into the description that, that Peter had, had given and, and Tolkien had obviously had written about. So uh, Rick Porras, our co-producer, was there during one of these discussions one day about the ring and... The next day we ended up shooting this little sequence um, where we all sort of play these different characters um, and uh, we needed a prop so I pulled off my wedding ring. And action, Frodo! <laughs> when we were done I said, you know, Pete, I actually think that you know, obviously I'm biased, but I really like the way my wedding ring looks. And, oh, you know, everyone loves their wedding ring. But anyway, it, it had a sort of shape to it that that just had a nuance that was slightly different from the others. And so we took that with us the next time we went to Jens Hansen to talk about the design of the ring. and Making some adjustments after that, they kind of rounded it off a bit, but sort of they used that as, I guess, a basic starting point for the, for the one ring. And... Action. It's been a, you know, a, a huge kind of collabor collaborative process all the way through, and there hasn't been a great kind of division of um, your labor. And so you've had people who might have been brought on as painters who suddenly find themselves sculpting or kind of hammering stuff together. And um, so I've done you know, my share of kind of heaving props around and, uh, and gardening, <laughs> pushing wheelbarrows full of gravel. <laughs> the film was epic in every sense of the word. There was 3,000 people in the crew, 300 people in the art department. Everyone was dedicated to what they were doing, even if they weren't great Tolkien fans before they started working on the picture. They took it on board, they lived with it, they became part of Middle Earth. So much more went into making this movie than can ever appear in the movie itself. Well, that was the aim right from the beginning, you know, to create a, a world that you felt had been in existence for hundreds of thousands of years. Being able to think of it and see it as, a, as something that is real certainly made it real, you know. And now, now it, it does exist, you know, it does exist somewhere. Weta Workshop was kind of like visiting some wild fantasy land. It's like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory but without the candy. I went to the Weta Workshop, which is quite unlike anything I've ever seen in my entire career, and they made everything you see in the film. They made all the armor, all the weapons. Richard Taylor, the man in charge, I think he's a genius. He's built this workshop that is world-class in every respect. Richard Taylor has also been one of the, the, the single most important people involved on, on this production, because Richard has, with enormous dedication and enthusiasm, taken on one of the most difficult jobs. We chose to look after the design, the fabrication, and the on-set operation of the special makeup effects and prosthetics, the armor, the weapons, the creatures, and the miniatures. I think Richard made over 45,000 different items for, yeah. uh, for the film, including the miniatures and the prosthetics. So his workload over the three or four years that he has been involved has just been phenomenal. He's a very charismatic guy, so a very great leader. So his people were really devoted to, to him and to the task, and, and their work showed it. Employing mainly young people whose primary expertise was not in filmmaking, but whose talents had been recognized by Richard Taylor because of they were artists of one sort or another. The Weta Workshop is very much a physical and spiritual extension of Richard Taylor and Tanya Roger because it embodies the every molecule of philosophy of Richard's work ethic. So where do I start? Peter has told me that he wants to make Lord of the Rings 
and a great fortune for us, he wants to make it with us. How do I inspire in this young group of New Zealand designers and technicians the philosophies and the vision that will carry this film for five years and deliver it onto the world stage in a way that's worthy to the written literature of Tolkien? Gathering around us a like-minded group of young New Zealanders, I very much believed as I do today what I said to them then. If you couldn't rise to the highest level of enthusiasm, passion and professionalism and grasp this task as if it was the most important thing that you have ever taken on in your life, you weren't worthy of the task. We had been blessed with the opportunity to bring a piece of modern English folklore to the screen. So often in fantasy filmmaking, it's necessary that the actor occasionally turns to the audience and throws them a wink. You know, just buy into this, just accept that this world exists. That couldn't happen with The Lord of the Rings. It was imperative that Middle-earth was real. Kind of like a prehistory to English and European history, that, that, it, that it did exist at one point. And since he was treating it that way, he was looking at it as a history, um, that really, you know, that really kind of worked its way through every fabric of the production. But what we appreciated was that if we could hold on to a large number of the departments, we could possibly make a more cohesive approach through our design work and the delivery of the images that we put on screen. Richard Taylor's philosophy was always ground this in reality, we want gritty realism. We're making a historical film, we're not making a fantasy film. To that end, we looked at a lot of historical influences. Um, while we didn't want to make it obvious like you go, oh look, the elves are Greek or the dwarves are this or that. We didn't want to make it obvious like that because that's not what we're doing. What we wanted to create were alternative cultures that look like they could come straight out of history, but you're never quite sure where they're from. The development of the cultures, the species and the races the development of the total physical reality of the creatures was imperative so that this finely woven tapestry would create a backdrop of heightened reality upon which the actors could play out this incredible story. There are so many races and cultures in Lord of the Rings and it would be very easy for many of us as designers who are familiar with the material to really indulge ourselves a little bit um, in it and just develop these cultures to the nth degree. But what we needed to do was really make them so they were accessible to general audiences who hadn't read The Lord of the Rings as well. Daniel seemed to grasp everything that was good in Middle Earth. All the elves, the beautiful swords that the elves carry, he was able to design the, the richness of the cultures of these particular characters. But brooding underneath the harsh cloud of Mordor on the other side of the room was Waramahi. He looked after the Urukai. He did a lot of the orc design, the goblins, anything that was nasty and spiky came out of Warren's pencil. A year into our design process and a year into the project, we had the great fortune of Alan Lee and John Howe joining us. Mm -hmm. We'd already adopted some of their sort of stylistic interpretations into our interpretation. Uh, however, when they came on board, it really gave us a solid grounding and also a tremendous upskilling and a tremendous experience base to draw from because here are these amazingly talented guys who've been living and dreaming talking for years. They'd broken a lot of ground for, um, for the weaponry, the armor and the creatures, which was their primary mandate. And because we were working on the same floor, in the same set of buildings. There was a lot of fraternization going on. We would be, I would, certain, above all me, I'd be wandering out to see what they were up to and see what they were drawing. And, and it was very stimulating because seeing someone else treat a, any given subject, uh, you've got only one desire is to have a shot at it yourself. Everything was kind of thrown into the melting pot, really. And um, people would give us feedback and we'd go off and do another day's work and you know, have something ready for the next uh, design meeting. Now, Jamie Bess Warwick and Mike Asquith didn't draw. They're sculptors, and they can conceptualize through three-dimensional sculpture as quickly 
as an illustrator can come up with ideas through drawing. We always start off with tiny little what we call thumb markets, tiny little studies that are done extremely quickly that just begin to capture the feeling of form. And then from those, working on top of precast either third scale busts or sixth scale figures will conceptualize the characters. Jamie Bess Warwick did a number of original sculptures, one-offs, that are in the final film today. It was incredible how quickly he was able to capture Peter's vision and deliver designs that carried on through to final shots on screen. What orders from Mordor, my lord? As you step down the stairs, it was like going into a manufacturing zone, but not in the sense of a production, it was like going into the depths of Middle Earth. As you came around the corner and stepped into the studio, the enormity of what we were doing began to strike, mostly from the first effect, which was looking at the stone trolls that would be glowering back at you. But as you moved through the studio, there were the huge towering miniatures on either side, crammed in there. You literally had to weave your way through these huge buildings that were just all teetering and just sitting in position, packed into that studio. There is something special about using miniatures that Peter loves, and Peter wanted to do as much of this on large miniatures as he could. So Richard Taylor said about the task of building, as I say, these 58 very, very large miniatures. On Lord of the Rings, we coined the phrase bigotures because over half of the miniatures that we built at the Weta workshop were the size of sound stages. Mary McLaughlin and John Baster and the other miniatures teams did a beautiful job to make this immense size. The mill in, in Hobbiton, Richard really came up one day and with a photocopy of the sketch and said, right, it's about yay long and about yay wide, right? And I said, yeah, I guess so, sure. <laughs> and they went away and um, a week later this incredible model had emerged which looked exactly like exactly like the sketch. I mean, I've never done a picture of this many miniatures. I don't think anybody's done a picture of this many miniatures. Because one of the things that Peter chose to do was where in many cases we would have done a matte painting, he's chosen to use a miniature instead. Or a miniature with a slight bit of matte painting to blend it into live action. So we're doing a huge number of shots where we're dropping a miniature behind a live action scene. Which is wonderful because it means that we get the, the beauty of the live action and then we're able to expand it and amplify it and create the environment into which this live action scene will play. And that's pretty neat. Now the journey of bringing a creature to the screen is quite an enjoyable one. Of course it starts with the incredible amount of conceptual design. Then we roll on and do the three dimensional marquettes, slowly honing the form and the character and the study of each creature. After that we would sculpt uh, larger sculptures that you could really get into the details on and work them out. And often those sculptures were then scanned for the digital department to replicate in three dimensions if it was going to be a digital character or they would be moulded and turned into masks if it was going to be a uh, prosthetic character. One of the most enjoyable characters to create for Lord of the Rings was the creature, the Watcher in the Water. And it was important to us that we didn't just create a, a sort of a bizarre tentacled kraken, this thing that was uh, a mess of massive number of tentacles, but rather it, like everything in Middle Earth, was in pursuit of the ring. We also wanted the feeling that when it burst out of the water, it would appear to increase in size, sort of like the swelling of an octopus or the, or the hairs coming up on an angry cat. So these unusual shell-like structures that carry these villi of hair that filtrate the nutrients out of the water swell up and open up like these big shells to give the creature added aggression and added size. What appears to be this gummy maw finally rolls out and becomes a huge set of teeth. I described it to the guys as if it's this bizarre sphincter. It would actually act it out with my hands as if the teeth roll out and there they are biting at the end of my fingers. Each tentacle ended in two fingers and an opposing thumb. So when Frodo is grabbed by the leg and lifted up, 
these tentacles can try and find out where the ring is. John Howe has illustrated the Balrog many times and there was a great number of elements in his original designs that Peter loved. It's like lava in a thin, in a thin shell and the heat that it radiates is, is just phenomenal. We wanted the feeling that this was some sort of bizarre bull hybrid with a dog. It's got a whip lashing lizard's tail, these are knuckly toes and this huge backbone crest of flame that erupts to show its height and anger. It's got these large bull horns that come around to the front of its face. Ben Wooten, one of our senior designers, took those original design drawings of John Howes and built on them in close accordance with John's thoughts to create a final large-scale design market that stood about four to five foot tall perfectly captured all of the elements that we wanted in this creature. Peter would come into our design studio each day to critique our work and give us his thoughts, and as he has always done over the years, would actually perform the character. He would lumber around the design room pulling these great faces and very quickly inspired Jamie and the other designers with the ideas of what the cave troll could be. And Jamie very quickly captured the feeling of the slightly moronic, slow childlike character that has all the trappings of a creature that is relatively quiet and docile until it's provoked into a rage. We wanted the feeling that the cave troll would sit in hibernation for many years, so all of its underbelly is soft and fleshy-like, where the backs of its body that's exposed to the elements becomes like the cracking on the back of a well-worn foot. He also has these unusual fingers. He has these nails that don't so much grow from underneath the quick, but are actually a part of the overall end of the fingers. And these are used as huge shovels for digging into the dirt and helping mine in the mines of Moria and dig out little hollows for its hibernation in winter. This then is skinned and plasticine, carefully detailed and sculpted to replicate the look of the original design market exactly. And it is this larger market that then the digital department scans to capture all of the complexity and fine detail of the surface finish as well as the overall form into the computer. And in doing so, make sure that the art of the design team at the Weta Workshop is carried through into the digital realm. <coughs> Now the department that we oversaw at Weta that required the most extensive amount of work was the realisation of the creatures through prosthetics. Although we had small and subtle prosthetics for a lot of the lead actors, the most prolific amount of prosthetic work was used on those that are evil in Middle Earth. The Urukai, the Goblins and of course the Orcs. Peter wanted something special for the Goblins. Moria. We drew all kinds of crazy creatures that were that you couldn't, you could never hope to get anyone inside a suit to play those. But making them into these sort of insect-like creatures with with uncomfortable spikes, and I think Jamie probably sculpted up the actual faces they have. Over the length of three films, we produced over 10,000 facial appliances, over 1,800 body suits and foam latex. We brought that in by the container load. Every couple of months, we'd have a new container of foam latex arrive. It was purely brought into the workshop to make the thousands of hobbit feet, the suits of urukai and orc undergarment bodies. The foam latex ovens ran 365 days a year for three and a half years to manufacture 
the massive amount of appliances out of three huge ovens. It was amazing how much foam latex we used. I could never have visualised that quantity. All of the prosthetics then had to be washed, seamed, painted and stored on racks ready to go out on set. Prosthetics have a very limited life. Facial appliances only last a day and full suits only last six days before they're requiring to be returned to the workshop for either servicing or to be ground up into foam pellets and thrown away. On top of that too had to come all the paint and the specific sort of prosthetic materials and makeups in order to service the application on set. They also had to be imported from LA. We had a team of 12 makeup artists operating under Marjorie Hamlin and Domini Till who looked after respectively the first and second unit prosthetic requirements for Weta Workshop. Each day a multitude of characters would be applied into elaborate facial appliances and then put into full foam latex body suits, teeth would go in, contact lenses and the wigs would finally be fitted to create the overall feeling of these unusual creatures. We'd been working for over a year to develop the feet for the hobbits. Possibly one of the trickiest things that we made on Lord of the Rings because we had to make a compound that was both tough yet flexible. In one casting, you could blend it onto the foot and it would invisibly blend around the ankle line while still giving enough support to the bottom of the actor's feet. We produced over 1,800 pairs of hobbit feet for the four leads alone. You know, because the wetter guys back at the shop are constantly taking the, the feedback from, from these guys and, and making little design adjustments. But for a long time, when you walk, when I would walk, the feet would kind of bounce. You know, they kind of bounce a little bit. And now they're, these are actually amazing. I haven't even noticed it. They're really amazing. So what you try and do is to get a little grip action. And, uh, but if, if, but not too much, not too much. Because it doesn't actually bend at the knuckle. But there's there's things when you like walk on a toe, you learn how to kind of work the foot a little bit. You know, you can you can kind of, kind of have it sitting there. Unless a kid comes to visit the set and you say, oh yeah, these are my feet. Oh, sorry. They'd settle their feet into these pre-glued, foam latex appliances and then over the next hour to hour and a half the feet would be very carefully glued to every millimeter of their own feet. If they weren't glued properly they'd become very quickly detached from their own feet and they'd begin to slide in the prosthetics. Finally the blending edge was carefully applied around their ankle and the color was blended up their legs the little hair pieces that gave the furry impression on the top of the feet had to be hand knotted one hair at a time every day. Then they go off to the production makeup trailer where their ears were glued on by the makeup staff. So a day in the life of a hobbit was very much a matter of having to know that you were slipping into those sticky, cold, rubbery feet and then throwing yourself into any environment that New Zealand could offer up for the whole day and just put up with the feeling on the undersole of your feet. I would go to Weta all the time. I was fascinated with what they were doing. Liv would often come down to the workshop and sit with us and just talk over things, be involved in the making of stuff, actually sit for her own sculptures and get to know the guys really well. So we all had to have these face casts done and I went in to have it done and they, I really didn't know what to expect at all and uh, laid back and they kind of strapped my hair down and put Vaseline or something on my face and just suddenly within seconds First my eyes, then my mouth, and then just everywhere this enormously thick, horrible goo came over me. And when they finally took it off, there's like this great suction that happens when they finally take it off where you can't breathe for a couple of minutes. And I had this weird like kind of face, which <laughs> just really funny. I have quite a large nose and uh, it should have been sufficient for Gandalfs, but once you expand the size of your head with facial hair, 
perhaps, then your own features might tend to get a little bit lost in it, and, and to exaggerate the prominence of a nose is sort of keeps everything uh, matching. And it took two or three days and a variety of tries to get what we all thought was right, simply because you, you, you can design a makeup on paper, but, but once you then apply it to a particular face, it may not turn out quite as you intended. Gandalf, we could pass through the mines of Moria. My cousin Balin would give us a royal welcome. There is no actor involved in Lord of the Rings that sustained more difficult prosthetics time than John Rhys Davies. At all turns, he tried to make the whole process as enjoyable for himself and Gino, the makeup artist in charge of looking after him. Today, I'm painting a set of uh, Gimli's prosthetics, and he's got this cowl piece that he's going to be wearing. That'll slip on over his head. They'll put that on first, and then uh, then the prosthetics will be put on. Then uh, just the forehead here. The forehead will go on, and then we've got the uh, nose and cheek pieces. Every day he would come in. His face would be cleaned, his hair put back, a final shave of any stubble and the process began. Four and a half hours later, the foam latex head appliance, the ears, the silicon facial appliances, the huge amount of hand-knotted hair, beard, moustache was applied to turn John Rhys Davies into the character that you see as Gimli. And uh, I always try to make it my business. Whenever I was in costume and in makeup and I had the armor and all that on, and I was close enough, I would go back and show them the results of their work as it actually looked on, and show them what they'd done. As you walked into the armor department, there was a different feeling. There was always a frenzied feeling in the armor department because there was a transformation going on all the time. There was armor being created out of leather, very organic armor, very gritty and grim. Certain parts of the armor department had fantastic array of metals and buckles and rivets and all the sorts of things that would hold it all together. Then you'd move through into the area that was where the steel armour was made and that in itself was a huge experience because of the fact that the sound itself of the metal being beaten onto an anvil was so loud and so organic that you just couldn't help feeling like you were sort of a part of Middle Earth in there. John Howe is one of the world's leading people in the understanding of medieval armour and weapons. When John arrived, he was able to bring to Weta a level of design knowledge, fabrication, and some of the complexities of the construction of armour that we didn't understand at that point. Armour is the most impossible thing to understand. And to, um, and to render illustratively, because all of these static shapes interact with each other in very, very surprising ways. And it's nearly impossible to understand unless you have some, you know, some fairly serious layman's knowledge about how it works. It's always frightening and astonishing about how beautiful it all is. But I've worn a lot of the real stuff because I'm one of these really thin guys who can get into it all. He was able to let us know what worked and what didn't, why things were built in a certain way. And that level of inheritance and that level of culture and history that he was able to invest into our armor making process was a wonderful thing for us at that point in the making of Lord of the Rings. You can design your heart out, you know, for months with a pencil and a paper, but the actual materials themselves, whether it's leather or wood or stone or metal, will lead your hand to shapes and ideas that you cannot arrive at just with a pencil and paper. We also had the great fortune of finding two armorsmiths. In the tiny country that is New Zealand, here was two guys that were making a living from the fabrication of plate armor. Stu Johnson and Warren Green. Now, building a forge in the workshop was, um, Richard was very excited about that idea. He really wanted to approach the whole 
idea in as traditional a manner as possible. And the only way to do that is to get the stuff hot and to use a hammer and get it on an anvil and do it the way it should be done. So to that end, every single piece of armour was originally created in plate steel, hand beaten in the forge here at the workshop. Through designing the Urukai's armour, we wanted to give a feeling of a brutal and almost intuitive armour and weapons. These creatures are only armoured on their fronts. There's no armour on their backs because they would never run from the field of battle. These are the lightweight guerrilla fighting force that are sent out to hunt down the hobbits. They don't carry any heavy armour as they have to travel huge distances at great speed. Their helmets are made in a combination of leather and lightweight steel. The idea of all the spiky bits of leather is so as they're running through the forest, these things will bounce and move around, further creating the level of ferocity in their appearance as they charge along. The orcs aren't bad at making armour, they just make really ugly armour. And their armour is very, very successful. As you can see by this set of leather gauntlets, they've managed to create articulated lames. And their black speech motifs are tattooed into the leather to put their own incantations of evil into the leather surface. The concept behind these Maori orcs Peter said that he wanted them to look like cockroaches, scuttling in mass, these black, dark, nasty suits of armour. Now we based this helmet on a sort of a deep sea fish, theorising that most of their food would come through the deep cracks of the earth where these fish may be washed into these deep caverns. The helmet very much takes on the perception of this huge mouth of this deep sea fish. The feeling we wanted to get with Sauron's helmet was the feeling of a corpse, of the rotting face of a horse corpse, with those long bony structures coming out of those deep set socketed eyes, those great big nostrils for sucking in and blowing out a lot of air. The intaglio was put on as a thographic process that then was acid etched using sulfuric and hydrochloric acid to eat the surface of the metal to give the appearance that the surface of the steel is crawling with this wicked ivory all over it. Now here is a, uh, a Gondorian suit of armour from the prologue. A combination of plate steel underneath, covered by this tunic, encrusted with the heraldry of the tree of Gondor, the son of Numenor. Encresting the armour of the Gondor is these helmets. They carry the seabird's wings of the Gondorian motif. The antiquity of the helmet is such that it's made out of separate components. But an interesting feature is the way that we've actually glued the hair into the helmet. This is so the makeup department don't need to put wigs onto the actors every day. This is from the allegiance of men and elves as they fought with Sauron and the orcs at the plains of Golgoroth. The prologue elves are in the springtime of their years, so we tried to capture a motif, a colour, a palette of spring. The subtle greens, the succulent plant textures of the fabric. This is a, a race that is coming to the world, a race that is in the strengths of its time. It's got the insignia on the nose bar of the helmet. The feeling that you used to have when you were standing surrounded by all this armour was that it felt as though it had been discovered on an archaeological dig. It had that sort of realism about it. What was so deceptive is it wasn't. It was made out of plastic, urethane, all those sorts of materials that are so modern today. But in actual fact, the look of it had that detail and realism so well captured that it really did sort of deceive people. Chainmail is a problem. 
chainmail is a cinema nightmare and there is no convincing way to make any approximation of chainmail without a stroke of genius and most chainmail in movies is just awful. It's, it's, it's terrifyingly bad. It's either knitted wool that's been sprayed with aluminium paint or it's, or it's made of, you know, whatever and it always looks crappy. It never looks like the real thing. Richard came up with this new technique to create chainmail that was fairly light so that you wouldn't weigh down your actors, but much, much, much more real looking. So they actually devised a way of making it out of plastic. And the thing that they developed entirely in the workshop under the guidance of Richard and uh, Dominic, one of his chief geniuses, so they purchased pressure hose, which is uh, of, of the right diameter for a, a link of chain mail, which they would slit down the length. They devised a machine which would chop it into tiny slices. This machine is driven by pneumatics, controlled by an electrical servo, and over three and a half years, it cut 12 and a half million rings from a length of black alkathene pipe, over 12 kilometers of pipe. And then two gentlemen at Weta sat for the same length of time and hand assembled those 12 and a half million rings into hundreds of garments of incredibly lightweight chain mail. I have never seen a, a, an industry like that. This guy happily sort of linking little bits of chain mail together. I think he said with my armor that he'd link 80,000 pieces of chain mail together. I would not have traded this experience for the world. It has been the most amazing time of my life. No person was more important to the weapons than Peter Lyon. Peter had been making a collection of weapons over the years for the reenactment business in New Zealand. Pretty spectacular. I love the hero weapons. And you pick up one of those swords, the hero swords, and you realize you're, you're holding a real sword, a real weapon in your hand. Uh, very well balanced. Um, incredible, incredible craftsmanship. And many of these pieces belong in museums. Since I've started here, I've been working on things that are sort of the swords I've dreamed about working on. And I've also had nightmares about some of them. Uh, some of them have been very fiddly. Um, in particular, what have we got? Narsal is a good example. Narsal is actually, I'm sure, the only sword that's ever been designed with a hollow pommel, but it's still got enough weight to make it work. So sword fans, please be aware this is the first hollow pommel that has ever appeared on the screen. Now, all of this obviously takes a huge amount of person power. Over a hundred weapons were made in this style, where they're actually made in spring steel, exactly as they were 500 years ago. The fullers are individually ground in by eye against a huge linishing table to set the balance on the blade. The hilts are being hand ground out of either plate steel or cast out of bronze. And uh, a sword like this would take about a week. Lying next to it again is Glamdring, the sword that, uh, that Gandalf wields so heroically and uh, magically at times. Once again, it has the incantations of the elf speech woven into the crossbar to try and strengthen it in times of battle. You can see by the blade, there's the subtlest wasting of the blade through the length of the blade, and that's to give it a slight leaf-like form to give it the feeling of organic, nature-based forms within the blade. Sting. Yeah, take it, take it. It's so light. Yes, yeah, made by the elves, you know. I remember the day that I saw Sting for the first time, and it was sort of in its infancy. It wasn't completed yet. But I had already seen like the, the elvish inscriptions that they'd done on a metal sting. Now, sting has the same cultural inheritance as Glamdring does, Gandalf's sword. The handle is made out of kokobo, a hard wood from South Africa. And then it has a, uh, a silver intaglio that has been hand laid into the wood, finally being capped by a fairly simple but elegant hilt. 
you know, Boromir's sword is a strong man's sword. It's made for someone with very, very thick wrists. Boromir, of course, a descendant of Gondor, carries a, um, a one-handed fighting sword. It's actually a hand and a half. You can fight with it single-handedly, but the pommel is extended enough that if you want to draw into a two-handed blow, you, can, you have got the space to put your hand up onto the crossbar. The swords have to be balanced quite comfortably through just in front of the crossbar. It makes for quite a beautiful fighting sword. Sean Bean um, was very uh, en enjoyed flinging this weapon around. When you do get your sword, that becomes quite personal to you and, and you get familiar with it. But it, 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 you feel as though it is part of your body. I mean, it's an extension of your, your arm. And, uh, and we all took great pride in that. Legolas carries a quiver of arrows on his back. We made over 10,000 arrows for Lord of the Rings. Every race and every species has a different sort of arrow. Every arrow has its own head design. This has got a little floral motif on the actual blade of the head. It carries a, um, a green fletch uh, on it. This is his quiver that carried in his quiver are the white knives, his fighting knives. And you can see it has got an elven etching down the blade. The handle is in, inlaid with a gold etching that's laid into the timber. It's got boxwood as the uh, timber of the handles. These he carries over his back and he's able to draw both at the same time. You can see here the collection of axes that were required just for Gimli. He carries two little throwing axes. These are carried at his sides, he pops them out and he can then freely throw them as if they're a tomahawk. He carries his walking axe. This he carries to actually use as a walking stick as he walks along, um, but all, always at the ready in case of an enemy nearby. Um, then he has a very simple axe, which is just a standard fighting axe that he carries on his side. And then finally his double-headed axe, which he most commonly likes to use when taking on the orc. This he carries on his back. By a shrug of his shoulders and a flick of the wrist, he can pull it out of the back holster and quickly grab it, ready to take on the enemy. We try to once again inherit the culture of the different species, as you can see here with the geometry and the geometrics of the dwarven design into the head of the axe. And even the way that the leather has been laid onto the handle takes on the geometric nature of the architecture of Moria. We made a number of different versions of each actor's sword. Spring steel, heavy hero swords for tight close-ups, lightweight aluminium swords for fighting scenes, rubber versions for safety reasons. But Vigo, of all the actors, chose almost predominantly only to use the hero sword. I used it as much as I could, yeah, because it just would look more right, and also just the weight of it in your hand and how tired you would become, you know. It looks silly when you do a big battle sequence if everybody's like, ah, all the time. You know, at a certain point, you kind of miss, you deflect, you kind of, you can't keep that amount of energy going all the time. He caught us out as well on arriving at Weta. He said to me, so how would I keep it sharp? I asked for a little a sharpening stone, because if, you know, you're fighting that many times and you're, and you're parrying that many times, and cutting through, you know, armor and all that. I mean, you need to sharpen your sword now and then. So indeed, we went ahead and cast up a little urethane uh, replication of a whetstone, so that in theory, Strider could sharpen the edge of his sword. His sword was quite unusual because built into the scabbard was a little utility knife, a little tiny dagger that's not used in any way for fighting, but really an eating knife. Things like the eating knife that's part of the scabbard for the sword, it's just a practical thing, you know, what do you clean a rabbit or a deer with? You're not gonna use your sword, you know what I mean? I remember he came in and he was just really quiet, he was just really quite quiet, and he had this sort of steely look about him. 
and he picked up his sword and it just, you know, it's like, and he was like, can I, can I, can I take this, can I take this with me? Vigo treated that sword as if it was almost a holy relic that he carried by his side. It was wonderful for the sword makers and the technicians at Weta to see an actor accept the mantle of a character so fully through the use of the props that we had created. The greatest benefit for Weta Workshop having taken on the five departments that we did was that the singular Tolkien-esque brushstroke could be applied across as much of the workshop as possible. I was able to understand Peter's thoughts and then invest those thoughts through the designers into the individuals within the workshop. It's just been phenomenal. Um, his workshop is, is packed with stuff and he has a huge team of people. They have really led the charge in creating the different cultures of the various races of Middle Earth and the look of the weapons and swords. And without that team of people, um, these films would never have gotten made. It's as simple as that. Nyla Dixon, who's uh, our costume designer, did it, an incredible job. We set up a, uh, a sewing room for her at Stone Street Studios, which used to be an old paint factory. And uh, she had her 40 seamstresses working in there, creating over 19,000 costumes. And it's not merely creating costumes. Um, that's far too easy a concept than what she actually had to tackle. It was very collaborative, Lord of the Rings. The fact that Richard had really had been developing the concepts for Lord of the Rings, a lot of things were already in train before the wardrobe department ever showed up on the doorstep. I would say it probably took me a good three months to actually get how huge and complex this was. Because when I stepped on board, I don't think even I, who'd been doing, you know, quite big costume shows for quite a while, I don't think we'd grasped it on any level. In an incredibly short period of time, you have to try and absorb an incredible amount of information. As you can see, there's a few frocks in this wardrobe department. The very first thing that you have to do is you've got to break out that script and work out how many costumes are going to be required. So that meant that we had to make the lead actor's costume 10 times, and then we had to make the body double's costume. 10 times, and then we had to make the mini-me costume 10 times, and then we had to make the stunt double costume 10 times. So there are about 40 costumes of that one design. What I tend to do is you're always thinking about it, and the breakdown of the script, the budgeting of it, the costumes are moving through your mind all through that time and there'll be little doodles appearing here and there, and you know, you'll break away from the figures to do some of the research. I looked at every Tolkien book there was. All of John Howe and Alan Lee's illustrations, they suggest rather than say. So my role was to take that suggestion and say what they were wearing. The jacket, the shirt, yeah. and the trousers right. last night yeah. on this one. Yeah. Everything about the Hobbits, um, descriptive-wise, was these very country, and I wanted to use a lot of that sort of 18th century design style, the little frock coats, the waistcoats, all of those things that are really quite uh, English. And that naturally, with these big feet, uh, took me to the idea of chopping off their trousers. So that they're kind of wearing these wacky little half-mast pants. When it came to the character Frodo, I wanted to separate him out and make him seem a bit more of a young gentleman. So in that sense, we dressed him in velvets, but still had all the rougher elements that the hobbits had in general. It absolutely made me feel more like a hobbit, especially with the feet on and the wig. It just, it had that hobbit image. So the clothes were kind of essential, and 
you know, it would be the first thing I'd put on in the day that would begin my process into being a hobbit. The Aragorn costume. We workshopped that one so much with Vigo. Nyla was wonderful in that she allowed me to be part of that process, you know, so that we could give the character and give Peter something first and foremost that visually appealed to him and felt right, but for me, was comfortable. We put a lot of detail into this because the idea is that for the character, for Vigo as an actor, as he puts on this costume, layer by layer, he is putting on that character. And that, to me, is a really essential part of being a costume designer, that you can aid a performer in becoming that character for a day. The idea was that this was a man of um, great travel, so it needed to be very flexible, and it needed to look like this guy had slept in any cave or crevice or, and traveled great distances. Vigo Mortensen, who played this character, really was um, into this idea that he himself had repaired it when it, you know, when it starts to sort of come apart. It's got certain sort of medieval um, ideas in this attached sleeve, which I actually think is a very practical thing as well. I mean, if it gets too hot, if it's summer and this person's traveling, it, it does have the idea behind it that this can be detached and then just whipped back on. It was a choice of mine to go for this really beautiful green, which a lot of discussion about this costume is it's black. Well, it's not, let me tell you. This is a beautiful licorice green color. We thought it was really important to have some pieces on him that told a different story to this rough, traveling, um, fighting man. And it's in places like this that we felt that we could just slip in um, the sense that he came from or was given things that were much more regal. With the elves, I wanted the Rivendell elves to feel different to the Lothlorien elves. How we went about that was a slight colour shift. There's a bit more colour around the Rivendell elves and the rather Lothlorien elves. And other than that, the design um, ethic of both is very similar. What I was looking for was the sense that these people were not of this earth, this middle earth. He wanted the sense that these people f sort of floated through the landscape. So I hung all the elf costumes off the tops of their bodies, so giving them as much length as I possibly could to accentuate this idea that these elves were much taller than man. Galadriel is the ultimate elf. She is our most white, our most beautiful are most elegant, and most of Kate's dresses have this very, very slight drape around the neckline. Um, again, these really huge sleeves, again, a lack of jewelry other than what are considered important pieces to the story. But we used the most glorious beaded fabrics that we could get our hands on. And for the men, you do want them to have an incredible presence so we went for quite a sort of high collar, smooth hanging and these huge sleeves that the idea when they lifted up their arms that they would fall back and under the sleeves are these really beautiful brocades that have got quite a lot of um, metal thread in them, which of course gives you that fabulous glisten. I wanted a relationship between the elven costumes and the wizards because I think there is a relationship between those two. With Saruman, I wanted to create the sense this is the head of this order. I wanted a grandness, and I also wanted him to have the stature of an elf. This is the costume of Saruman the White, um, who was played to perfection by Christopher Lee. The concept behind this um, costume was to give it as many textures as we possibly could, because when you've got a character who's called Saruman the White and he's going to be in um, white robes, we needed to get some sense of definition happening to, to that costume. And so the way we went about it was to use different textures in the fabrics themselves 
So um, whether it's the linens in this underneath piece, these incredible brocades here, um, and then we went to a silk, which has got quite a lot of pattern in it. And a lot of these sorts of things don't come up on camera in a huge way, but what they do is they just give it much more life. It's also slightly worn. It wouldn't be brilliant, glowing white. It couldn't be after thousands of years or hundreds of years. So they were very clever there. They said it must look not exactly shabby, but worn. We've really aged this costume down. It's quite extreme at times. You know, like we've actually sort of put quite a bit of life into that breakdown. You can see, you know, it's starting to get ever so slightly threadbare in places. And again, looking for elements that were going to create that sense of age. He's been a wizard for a long time. It would be wise, my friend. Tell me, friend. When did Saruman the Wise abandon reason for madness? There's a lot of drawings of Gandalf. In fact, he is the one who appears in more images than anyone else in the most defined way. In the discussions with Peter, Peter constantly referred to a drawing of John Howes. And I went, why don't we see if we can make this come off the page? The actual gown of Gandalf came together really really easily. There's lots of hand stitching on it. There's lots of men's in it. The idea was that this man needed to look like he never took this costume off. You know, we liked that idea of bits of twig and leaf caught up in it. I was always concerned that there should be mud on the fringes of the uh, long robe. And if he'd been riding, that there should be splattered uh, mud further up the costume. Then we began work on this hat. Now, I have this fabulous milliner who works with me, Hayley May. So we developed it to a point where Pete felt that we were, you know, we all were feeling that we were getting there and waited for Ian McKellen to arrive. I mean, I can still remember the look on Ian's face as the hat was handed to him. I mean, he's such a fabulous man, and he just, there was just this imperious kind of, hmm, like this, and then he, popped it on his head and it's it's one of those magical moments where even Ian himself had to admit that suddenly Gandalf was in the room with us. Just because that was her intent is to make this forget any other movies that she's done forget whatever movies you've done you're here you're playing this character let's make this work and let's make it look interesting as well and she did that.